We're going to talk about um, finances and romances, and I have an objective here, and you might, you might say, finances, romances? Well, listen, good news. If you're broke and single, this message is still for you, okay? <laughs> so don't take the next four weeks off, like, oh, I'm all set there. At the heart of this series is placing God first, right? The very foundation of this is putting God first. And so in the area of finances, I hope that you won't be disappointed to know that I don't have any stock tips for you. You won't hear anything like that. In fact, all I could tell you is buy low and sell. You already knew that. All right, we're all set there. And in the area of romances, neither will I be giving any, you know, romantic advice. I'm not going to tell you, you know, what songs you can play to make your wife more amorous or key phrases you can give to your husband to get his posterior off the couch. I don't know those things. But I will tell you this. The message is PG-13. Pastoral guidance suggested. Okay, so we're going to talk about some serious things, and I just wanted to warn you so that you know we're going to keep it real here, okay? Got me? Okay, so what I hope to do in this series is elevate God a little higher in our thoughts, and so that we would be careful not to end up where the writer of the book of Hebrews warns us that we can wind up, and it says this in Hebrews 2 verses 1 and 3 it says so we must listen very carefully to the truth we've heard or we may drift away from it what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus Christ so uh w- what it's saying there is hey sometimes we drift from God's word don't we And so we need to focus here. And so we strive to use the Bible as our guide for life and conduct. It's having a biblical worldview, if you've ever heard that. And basically, all the things that happen in our world, we interpret through the lens of this Bible. And we try to make all of our actions and decisions through what we can learn by reading this book. Amen? And so today, we're going to cover the life of Joseph. And we're going to do it in the ne- this week and the next week in, in this series. And so we're going to uh, look, he, if you look in Genesis chapter 37, he's, his life kind of starts right there and it ends around Genesis chapter 50. But we're going to look at the big picture of those chapters in regards to finances and romances. And so we're going to just walk through the story of Joseph in a nutshell. Now, first of all, he's one of 12 brothers, moms and dads, 12 sons. Think about that. That's a lot of roughhousing. That's a lot of wrestling. In fact, I'm pretty sure they wrestled because their dad wrestled. Jacob wrestled with God in Genesis chapter 32, I believe. And because he was wrestling God, that would probably make him a pro wrestler. So that's a pretty serious matchup, right? <laughs> so these kids... 12 sons, and uh, he's the second youngest. Joseph is the second youngest. He has 10 older brothers and one younger brother. Only Benjamin is younger than Joseph. Now, imagine having 10 older brothers. For some of you, I know you have many older siblings, but maybe not 10 older brothers. But I had one older brother growing up. And if he wanted to, he was very successful at making my life hard, right? (laughs) Now, Jacob wasn't the smartest parent. I didn't say he didn't love his kids, but he did something that no parent should ever do, and he showed favoritism among his kids. Jacob favored Joseph. And we see that in Genesis 37, verse 3 and 4 here. It says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe or an amazing technicolor dream coat, if you've ever heard it that way. He made him a very nice coat. And so when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, 
They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, in here, you just notice it does say Israel. That's because God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So, so if, if you see that and you say, where does Jacob's name come in? That's Jacob. So the first thing I want you to know this morning, if you have your notes, and you can write this down, is it's okay to have a rough start. It's okay to have a rough start. In regards to finance and Finances and romances, we're going to look at that through that lens this morning. But all of the extra praise and affection that came from Joseph's dad actually probably made Joseph's life harder. If Jacob really loved Joseph, he might have done well to treat him the same as his other brothers, not be so glaringly, you know, open about that. And it's possible that Jacob's favoritism, so Joseph's dad's favoritism, was starting to affect Joseph negatively. And we see that in Genesis 37, chapter 2. He tattled on his brothers. He said this, and he brought their father a bad report about them. So here's, here's Joseph coming back. Now he's kind of tattling on his brothers. Now Joseph's family business was shepherding. That was shepherding. That's muddy, smelly, dirty animals, corralling them, okay? So in verse 3, we saw that his dad bought him this amazing coat, right? Let me ask you a question. How much help do you think Joseph was after he had this awesome coat that his dad gave him? How much help do you think he provided in shepherding? Right. <clears throat> So I've worked in some grimy places, some shops and construction sites, and I've seen what happens when a boss or someone who's overdressed shows up there, right? They're kind of tiptoeing around, trying not to get dirty, right? And I've heard what everyone says about those people when they show up, right? How many of you have been to a place like that where maybe it's even an OSHA worker shows, shows up way overdressed, right? So Joseph bragged to his brothers about dreams he had of them serving him. And we read that in verse uh, 5 here. It says, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Now, I want you right now, if you have a younger sibling, I want you to imagine your younger sibling, not just your younger, but the youngest kid in your household, coming up to you and saying, hey, I had this dream that I owned a pizza shop and you were my delivery guy, <laughs> right? Okay, now, as offensive as that might be to some of you, Joseph's dreams were way more offensive because in his dreams, his brothers were bowing down to him. That's pretty offensive. Now, as a pastor, I can tell you this. Anytime I give a message about a certain topic, especially money, or relationships, I feel like there is this giant magnifying glass on my life, and the sun is just coming through it, and I can feel the heat, right? It's like a giant mirror. If you want to feel the heat, pick a topic to preach about and see if you measure up. So just like Joseph, I've had some rough starts in life. I did not come to Christ. I didn't really start serving Jesus until midway through high school. And I didn't start in ministry until I was 30. Even though I went to college right out of high school, I had, I had some rough starts. And I didn't start saving money until I was well into my 30s. That's okay. It's never too late to start doing the right thing, no matter how old you are. Amen? So many of us have had a rough start, romantically or financially. But God's word always points to us starting right now. If you need to start over, you start over right now. You don't worry about tomorrow or get angry about yesterday. But God's word says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, it says now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Hebrews 4, 7 says today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Joshua 24, 15, choose this day whom you will serve. Proverbs 27, 1, don't go bragging about tomorrow. Ephesians 5.16, make the most of every opportunity. So if you've had a bad start like Joseph 
or like myself, you can start fresh today, wherever you are financially, wherever you are romantically. And when I say start fresh, please understand that I do not mean filing for bankruptcy or divorce, okay? (laughs) Just let's listen to the story here. So I want you to hopefully please remember this story because many of Joseph's setbacks were not self-imposed. I understand that he tattled on his brothers and he told them this crazy dream, right? Those are a little bit of self-imposed setbacks. But his dad favored him and that caused him a lot of grief. And as we read the story, as it unfolds this morning, you will see many of his setbacks were not caused by him. So maybe your adult age kids or your spouse or your ex has caused you a lot of financial trouble. But instead of resenting what they did, you can move on today by forgiving those who've caused you such setbacks. Amen? Amen. So next, it all starts with a dream. It all starts with a dream. Joseph had a dream in in verse 5 here in Genesis 37. So my question for you this morning is, what is your dream? What is your dream? What is your dream financially? What is your dream for your relationship? Joseph suffered a lot of setbacks but they don't seem to affect his dreams. And we'll see why in a moment. In verse 20, they see his brothers coming and they decide they're going to throw him in a hole and let him die. Now think about that for a second, okay, before we just pass over. Sometimes you can read something so offensive and egregious. You're like, they see a hole and decide to throw him in it. Verse 23 says that the hole was empty and had no water. So they're going to throw him in a hole in the hot desert sun and let him either starve to death or dehydrate, whatever comes first. So they're there eating, having lunch, and in verse 25, they see a slave caravan coming and they sell him. So um, they decide they're going to sell him to slave traders. And verse 2, if you have your Bibles, if you look at verse 2 of chapter 37, it says that Joseph is 17. He's 17. Now you think about how heartless these slave traders are that are coming by that lets Joseph's brothers sell their baby brother into slavery and not even bat an eye. I'm sure they understood what was going on, but they didn't care. I think it's safe to say that Joseph's family was highly, highly dysfunctional. And so... If you have dreams, if you have dreams, God wants you to know that having a dysfunctional family doesn't limit you to what your dreams are if you entrust those dreams to God. So whatever you've been handed, right? If your parents failed romantically, if they were a mess financially, you are not destined to repeat that. Do you hear me? Can somebody say amen? Amen. You know, Galatians 3.1.3, right here, Galatians, it says, Christ paid the price for us from the curse that God's laws bring by becoming cursed instead of us. How many of you used to have a 313 area code or you still have a 313? Raise them up. That's it? Okay, for those of you who aren't from Michigan originally, 20 years ago, how many of you had a 313 area code? Right? Okay, this verse is easy to remember because it's 313, okay? From the curse he set you free, Galatians 313, okay? Remember that when your crazy family is calling or they're acting up, okay? (laughs) From the curse he set you free, Galatians 313. So many of us have varying degrees of dysfunction in our families, But the story of Joseph, it lets us know that we're not tethered to the failures of our family. Whatever dysfunction you were handed, you are not tethered to repeat that stuff. So as we look at the story of Joseph, we're now going to jump to chapter 39. We're going to skip chapter 38, but just to whet your appetite, chapter 38 isn't about Joseph. It's about one of his brothers who goes out and picks up who he thinks is a prostitute. 
Okay, so you can read that on your own time. It's a very tawdry tale there in chapter 38, but it just shows you how dysfunctional Joseph's family is. So we jump to chapter 39 if you have your Bibles. Now, Joseph is working for a very powerful and influential military officer in Egypt, and his name is Potiphar. And verse... Uh, 2, 5, and 6 of Genesis chapter 39. We'll read them in a row here. It says this. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted, every, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Next. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord, I want you to notice this, was on everything Potiphar had. Notice that. Pay attention to that. The blessing of the Lord was on everything that this Egyptian military commander had. Next slide there. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. What's on the table at dinner? That's it. So Joseph works hard. He's unbelievably diligent and faithful. And guess what? Other people are reaping the benefits of Joseph's hard work. That's okay. Wherever you work, don't be resentful. You know why? Because resentment destroys dreams. Resentment destroys dreams. Setbacks don't destroy your dreams. Hear me now. Setbacks don't destroy your dreams. Michelle and I have lots of financial dreams, right? And we have lots of setbacks, okay? Um, I have an 04. I'm driving an 04. Proud of that, okay? Our other car is an 06. But I can guarantee you every now and again, there's a setback, that's okay. That doesn't destroy our dream. What destroys our dream is, is getting angry over it and being resentful. And we have five kids in our house. And I mentioned this before as a joke because there's this caricature of a dad who's always yelling about, who touched the thermostat, right? Well, I came home one day and I said, who touched the thermostat? I've mentioned this before. You know why I said that? Because the thermostat wasn't on the wall. It was missing, okay? Where's the thermostat? Uh -huh. We have lots of setbacks, don't we, honey? But those setbacks cannot destroy your dreams. What destroys your dreams is resentment. Resentment destroys dreams. So wherever you work, it's possible, it's possible that everyone there is blessed and enjoying things they don't deserve because you're there, right? Right? How many of you would say, my workplace is blessed because I work there, <laughs> right? Some, of, some workplaces are more blessed than others, right? Now, keep in mind, Joseph was still stuck in slavery at this point. But if you read the account of Joseph's life, there's no mention of him yelling out to God, you know? God, why are you blessing Potiphar? I'm the one working hard. He doesn't do anything. All he does is worry about what's for dinner. That's not there. That's not there. And so we come to one of the most pivotal verses, I think, in Joseph's life. And this verse is verse 7 of chapter 39. Because many people I've seen have gone the other way. And it says this. It says, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. So we all know people who have taken the opposite route that Joseph has taken. We see them in the news, pastors in the news, or politicians, or pe prominent people who were right there where Joseph is in G Genesis 39, 7, and they succumb to this temptation. So in my opinion, this is one of the most pivotal verses in the story of Joseph. Now, no names. You don't have to shout out any names. But right now, I want you to think about some of the wealthiest men in the world, 
okay? Celebs, rock stars, politicians, whoever it is. Now, I want you to think about the girlfriends of these men, okay? So you have them in your mind. Now, what do they look like? Are they real ugly? I'm asking a question. <laughs> Are they ugly? No. No, they're pretty good looking, some of them, right? So listen to me now. Potiphar is one of the most influential, wealthy, and powerful people in Egypt. So what do you think Potiphar's wife looked like? Now, we don't know. But based on human experience of what we see now, and nothing new is under the sun, she might have been a looker, <laughs> right? So Genesis 39.10 says this. It says, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept, her, kept out of her way as much as possible. Joseph kept his distance. He was kind of stuck in a situation, but he did the best that he could to stay out of this trouble. So the next thing I want you to know there, Nate, is stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble. Whether that's financially or romantically, you guys know what gets you into trouble, right? If you have a computer in your bedroom and you can't handle that, Take it out if that gets you in trouble. If you're tempted to use a credit card, don't take it with you when you go shopping and don't memorize the numbers. <laughs> okay? Even something as simple as a, a, a cell phone. If you feel tempted, don't take it with you someplace private. Leave it. If you don't, don't go in the bathroom with it. I know that sounds silly, but whatever it is, if, if you're alone and you're not married and you're tempted, do what it takes. Or maybe going to the casino is too much temptation for you, even those restaurants that are all real nice there, right? Whatever trips you up, stay out of the way of trouble as much as possible like Joseph. Amen? So in verse 13, she grabs him, okay? And she literally tears off his clothes as he runs out. Genesis 39, 13, if you have your Bibles, it says that he ran out of the house naked. He, yeah, he ran out of the house naked. Then I ran out. I didn't grab no shoes or nothing, Jesus. I ran for my life. Thank you, sweet brown. Thank you, sweet brown. He ran for his life. He ran for his life. He ran out of the house naked. Now you think about that. Let that sink in for a second. Here's what I want you to know, Nate. Next slide here. It says, don't be afraid to look stupid avoiding sin. Genesis 39, 13. Now, how many of you ever, have ever thought this? Have you ever thought this? Do you think it might be possible that Joseph ran because he was afraid he might change his mind? Think about that. That he just had this instinct and he set his heart, you know, to, to serve the Lord. And this was so overwhelming that all he could do was run. Because the person that matters most in Joseph's life is God and what God says. And so he doesn't th worry about this world thinks, what this world thinks. And so you have to do things that really show that you're serious about avoiding sin. You can't just say it. You have to do things. So like young ladies in, in, the, in this world, if you decide that you're no longer going to pursue sexual relationships, like you're not married, you're, you're going to say, you know what? Yes, I want to be married. Yes, I'm interested in dating. No, I don't want to be alone. But I, from here on out, I'm not going to pursue that. And as much ridicule as you might get from this world, there are many people who wish they had made that decision. There are. There are many people who have given their virginity away to people where they don't even know where they live or if they're even alive anymore. Or people who have faced an unwanted pregnancy and done the unthinkable. Or they just carry the shame of an, an experience that they, they did not even enjoy. 
Now, whether you've made mistakes in the past or not, if you're deciding now to not give in to this world, okay, you had a rough start and some dreams suffered some setbacks, if that's you, I want everyone else in here to just say after me, say, you go, girl. You go, girl. Okay. I'm even going to clap. Would you clap? Whoever it is, if you see this online, if that's you, we encourage you, go. You go, girl. So I read this about this uh, passage in a commentary. Let me read this right from the commentary. It says this. Sin's rewards are always instant. God's rewards are seldom instant. They often take a lot more time to materialize, but they are always better. Now, Joseph is a slave to Potiphar, an unfair slave because they sold, his brothers sold him. He's not a captive of war. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't indenture himself to Potiphar. He's a slave to Potiphar. And here is Potiphar's wife offering herself to him. So there's a lot more going on than just uh, attraction. There is a potential for resentment, getting even getting even with someone who's wronged you. This is the ultimate wrong back on Potiphar, isn't it? Think about it. But Joseph knows that resentment will ruin his dreams. Can you hear someone in Joseph's place? Maybe not you, but people you know. This is what Potiphar deserves. She's coming on to me. This is what he deserves. Who's gonna tell on Joseph? If you look if you look right now, verse 11 in your Bible, on, on chapter 39, it says that the entire house was empty. This woman did her homework. She sent everyone away, probably way on the other side of town. Her husband was away. All the servants are away. And Joseph comes <whistles> walking into the house into this trap, right? Not one person's in the house. Who's going to tell on Joseph? You think she's going to tell on Joseph? She's not going to tell on him. Who wants to be one of Potiphar's servants that tells, jo tells Potiphar Joseph's cheating with his wife? Who wants to be that guy? Now, if there were ever a time that Joseph should have got an immediate reward for obeying God, it's right now, right? Hey, I resisted Potiphar's wife. Where's my reward? That's not what happens, is it, as we read? I believe, this is my personal belief, that if she had grabbed him and he had slipped away, let's say she wasn't able to grab his clothes and he, was, he slipped away from her without losing any of his clothes, then I think she would have thought of a more clever way to catch him another day, right? But that's not what happened. See, she grabbed him and he lost his clothes. And so we read in verse 14 that she yells that she's being raped. Why is that? Because we, see, we know from verse 13 that he ran out of the house naked. naked. This is PG-13. He was butt naked. Okay? <laughs> he was naked. How do you explain to your neighbors a naked man... When you send everyone away, it's just you and him. How do you explain that to all the neighbors in your well-to-do neighborhood, this naked guy that just came out of your house? So she was caught. And I want to encourage you again, don't be afraid to look stupid, avoiding sin. How dumb do you think Joseph felt? Okay? He probably felt embarrassed, ashamed. But that's not who he was aiming to please, right? I want you to notice this because this is really vital in this story. Notice how quickly her lust turns into rage and hate. See, that speaks volumes about what we think in our culture about sex and what we think lust is. Oh, he must really love you if he wants to have sex with you. She did not love Joseph. She wouldn't have done that to him. And dare I say it, that there are many men in our culture that are doing what they need to do to get what they want. But that's not love. 
And that's why God, in his wisdom, elevated sex to within the commitment and safety of marriage so that no one would be hurt. Sex and love are not the same thing. Incest is sex, but it is not love. Pedophilia is sex, but it is not love. Rape is sex, but it is not love. Pornography is sex, but that ain't love. Adultery is sex, but it is not love. Prostitution is sex, but it is not love. So if you're following along here in chapter 39, verse 20, Joseph gets thrown in jail. Now, you need to know this, that historians say at this time, the, the crime of rape in Joseph's day was a capital offense. That means it required Joseph's life. Joseph should have died. And so when I hear that he's thrown in jail, I wonder, just thinking out loud, how many other servants had tried to rape Potiphar's wife, right? In verse 21, it says this, Nate, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. So here's what I want you to know on this verse right here, okay? So... Next slide says this. If others have been unfaithful, the Lord is always faithful. So we don't know how many other men the warden has seen locked up for trying to rape Potiphar's wife. We don't know. But it says this. It says, uh, the next slide here says, the next verse, 23 here, says the warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. And the Lord was with him and caused everything to succeed. Everything. Everything to succeed. Now, once again, we see in Joseph's life that wherever he goes, he blesses people who probably don't deserve to be blessed. But he causes blessings to happen to other people. The warden of an Egyptian prison doesn't strike me as someone deserving of a great blessing from the Lord, right? Or deserving to be successful. But that is exactly what the Bible describes here. So I want you to think right now about where you work. Everybody knows that guy that doesn't serve the Lord, but he's always got money for stuff or always buying something new. And you know what? You might just say, hey, that guy probably works with a Joseph, right? So here's what you need to do. You need to apply where that guy works so you can be blessed, right? Or better yet, you can be a Joseph where you work. You can be a Joseph where you work. And you might say, oh man, Pastor Rusty, where I work stinks, man. I don't want to be blessed there. Oh, really? Is it an Egyptian prison? Where you work? Do you work in an Egyptian prison? I would dare say that your working conditions are probably a little better than that. Some of you aren't. Nope. Nope. (laughs) Nope. You don't know, man. Okay. Don't let resentment destroy your dreams. Don't resent coworkers who get bonuses. Don't. Maybe they got it because of you. Ooh. Don't resent coworkers who get pay raises or bosses who make a lot more money than you. You stay faithful to God and he will be faithful to you. Genesis 39, 21. So we know now from the story of Joseph for this week that we all may have dreams, right? And many of us have had rough starts and setbacks to those dreams financially or romantically. But we know from the story of Joseph that resentment destroys dreams. And so you need to stay out of the way of trouble. If what you're up to puts you into trouble, stay out of it. And not just stay out of it. Don't be afraid to look stupid, avoiding it. And many of us have been hurt, you know, because some in our lives have not been faithful. 
Maybe you've partnered with someone business-wise or you've entered into something financially and they've not been faithful or even in a marriage and that causes a lot of hurt. So there's gonna be setbacks in your life to what your dreams are and your goals and plans, but you can be like Joseph in this story. So as we close now, we're gonna close in song and we're gonna leave Joseph in jail for another week, if that's okay, okay? <laughs> In the real story, I'm sure he would have gladly taken one week in jail. He was actually in there for a couple of years. So as uh, Krista begins to play here, I'm just going to give an opportunity for uh, a time of prayer.